Okay. Good evening, everyone. And good evening, everyone watching on YouTube live. Um, bonsoir à tous. And welcome to the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. Um, I can't tell you how lovely it is to welcome you to our museum and welcome those online to tonight's program, Canada Storytellers, Trezor Zangu Mapani. My name is Rebecca McKenzie Hopkins, and I'm the Public Programs and Community Engagement Manager here at the museum. To begin, I acknowledge that we are in Jibuktuk, Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people. For many thousands of years, Mi'kmaq people have inhabited what we now call Nova Scotia. We are thankful for the way Mi'kmaq people consistently welcome settlers from other countries and help them to survive in this land. All Nova Scotians are treaty people, bound together by the promises of the treaties of peace and friendship. We are so happy to be welcoming Trezor to our Canada Storytellers stage. Canada Storytellers is an ongoing series of programs that aims to connect audiences with cultural works and their creators to explore themes of immigration, migration, multiculturalism, inequality, and identity. This series presents an opportunity for audiences to build understanding and empathy by immersing themselves in experiences that differ from their own but have common threads. This evening's program came to fruition due to our museum's brand new and super awesome relationship with a wonderful organization, the Global Center for Pluralism. We are fortunate to have created this event in partnership with the GCP and benefit from their warmth and passion for what they do. To tell you more about the GCP, about Trezor, and about the Global Pluralism Award, I'd love to invite Meredith Preston McGee to the microphone. Meredith Preston McGee is the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism in Canada. In this role, Ms. Preston McGee provides strategic leadership for the center and represents the center as an ambassador of pluralism to develop strong relationships with diplomatic communities, governments, and other institutions. Previously, Ms. Preston McGee mediated and advised a range of mediation processes as the Regional Director for Africa with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue and before that with the UN. Ms. Preston McGee served as an advisor to the late H.E. Kofi Annan during the Kenya National Dialogue and Reconciliation. Through more than 20 years in Africa, she helped to establish and facilitate peace processes in Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, and South Sudan, and elsewhere. Her work spanned a range of issues, including electoral conflict, disarmament, and demobilization, and inclusion. She contributes to policy discussions on peacemaking globally, including teaching peace process design. Ms. Preston McGee began her career supporting conflict resolution efforts of leaders in the Naga community of Northeast India and among ethnic minorities in Myanmar. Please welcome Meredith. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Good evening, Halifax. Uh, bonjour à tous. Hello to all of our online friends. I'm particularly uh, thrilled to be uh, here in Halifax. Um, as uh, Rebecca had mentioned, I'm the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism. We're based in Ottawa, where we gratefully reside on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I'm really, really excited to be here um, on Mi'kmaq territory for this amazing event with our fabulous partners at the Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. For those of you who don't know much about us, the Global Center for Pluralism was founded as a joint initiative between His Highness the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada. We believe that societies thrive when diversity is valued, when diversity is embraced. We seek to um, advance this mission by supporting educators, community leaders, policymakers, peacemakers, practitioners, artists, and a variety of disciplines around the world to advance more inclusive and equitable societies. What's really exciting for us about pluralism as a concept is how action-oriented it is. As we all know, diversity is a fact. Diversity is the thing in our societies. It exists everywhere. Pluralism are the actions that we take as individuals, the actions that we take as institutions to treat this, this diversity as something to be embraced and valued as core to the strengths in our society. 
This brings me in particular to our Global Pluralism Award, um, which is one of the flagship programs of the center. We use the award in order to shine a light on exceptional examples of pluralism in action, individuals, organizations, or even governments who are doing outstanding things to advance equity, inclusion, and diversity throughout their societies. The nominations for our fourth um, Global Pluralism Award are actually now live. So while well, you will hear from one of our amazing awardees from the third cycle, on your way out, if you are here, there are nomination cards at the back. If you're watching online, if you visit our website, you will be able to, uh, to get the information in case you have a pluralism champion in your community. We now have 30 pluralism champions. We have had three cycles of the award, and I know that there are more extraordinary pluralism champions out there, and we need your help in order to find them. So when we talk about exceptional individuals doing amazing things in a variety of fields, often people think about things like institutional reform, governance reform, and education. What we have found particularly inspiring in the Pluralism Awards is how powerful arts and culture is as a medium to express our common humanity across different cultures, across different communities, and as a gateway to have difficult conversations about really important issues in all of our societies. And I can think of no better example than our guest of honor tonight, Trezor Mpauni. So I'm going to introduce Trezor before I hand over the stage. Widely known as Menas La Plume, Trezor Nzengu Mpauni is a multilingual slam poet, hip hop artist, and writer from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And when I say multilingual, he speaks seven languages. Seven, just to be clear. Forced to flee his home country, Trezor came to Malawi as a refugee in 2008, relocating to the Zaleka refugee camp. In 2012, he founded the Tumaini Letu, Swahili for Our Hope, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting social, economic, and cultural inclusion of refugees through art and culture. Its flagship program is the annual Tumaini Festival, where each year, Zaleka Refugee Camp is transformed into an international festival ground. It draws thousands of people to Zaleka from Malawi and beyond to celebrate intercultural harmony, peaceful coexistence, and pluralism through music and cultural performances from Zaleka, from Malawi, and around the world. I know that we already have a list going at the Global Center. We're all going to be at the next Tumaini Festival with you, Trezor. So Trezor, please come and join us at the stage. Bienvenue. Welcome, Karibu Sana. Much merited, and uh, oh, I should remove this. Uh, uh, I was saying thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you very much to the uh, Global Center for Pluralism for bringing me here. Uh, so my first time to Canada, and um, also my very first time to Halifax. I'm very excited about this, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for for being here. It's really a pleasure. I haven't been performing for the past three years uh, for some reasons, but I'm so excited that I can do it again tonight. And uh, yes, I'm glad that you wonderful people are here and we can share one or two things. Um, first of all, uh, I'll start by um, performing one poem. Um, I'll perform three poems for you to, uh, tonight, and uh, the first one is entitled Ndife Amodzi. Uh, Ndife Amodzi means we are one in Chichewa, which is the main language from Malawi where I live. Um, I hope you enjoy. We are characters. We have no worth if isolated. We find the meaning only when part of a word. If we are words, we make more sense as a phrase. We are musical notes, more valuable when part of a common chord. 
One code is worthless unless part of a scale. We are different instruments combined in a symphony. Look me straight in the eye. You will see the reflection of your beautiful face in my gaze. There is no difference between you and I, even if borders falsely tell us otherwise. As innocent children, our souls communicate, although we were raised speaking different languages. Go back to the beginning. You will realize we have more similarities than differences. Travel back thousands of years. You will be shocked to discover we all came from one village and we lost each other when looking for pasture and fertile land. It would be a shame to deny others access to my little village when we have the whole planet to share. It would be a disgrace to prostrate my culture when we have millions of things to learn from each other in order to fully explore our human potential. With a smile, open your arms wide as a sign of welcome. Make me feel at home when I'm at yours and feel at home when you'll be at mine. After all, we are all citizens of the world. Thank you. Um, my second poem is uh, in French. So uh, my country was colonized by the Belgium um, and they taught us how to speak French. So then we didn't have a choice in class uh, and for everything when we wanted to understand we had to learn French. So uh, as part of that I speak French and um, I wrote this one in French. It's entitled Tu me manques. And Tu me manques is mostly, um, this poem is all about I would say it's a love poem. Um, I'm talking about uh, someone. It's someone imaginary. Um, so, but mostly it's about things that I miss. Um, I miss my country. Um, I now travel. I'm allowed to travel anywhere in the world, but I'm not allowed to travel to my own country because I hold a refugee passport. So. Um, I miss going back to my country. I miss so many things. And um, I thought of this one person, and um, yeah, it's a woman that I'm talking about. So I put all the things I miss in that one person, and um, I'm telling them how much I miss them. And uh, I know that Canada is a bilingual country, so if you don't understand this one, it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> So, I will not translate, uh, it goes like this. Tu me manques comme la pluie a un chant. Tu me manques comme le ton a une chanson. Tu me manques comme le fond a un texte. J'ai perdu mon éclat, ma beauté, mon parfum. Depuis que t'es parti, pareil une fleur fanée, je ne sers plus à rien au jardin. J'étais qu'un feu qui s'éteignait. Providentiellement, tu es venu avec ta braise, mais ravivé. Et soudainement, tu m'as repris ce beau cadeau sans m'aviser. Je suis qu'un brimborion. Sans toi, je suis moins qu'une feuille de brouillon. Moi et toi étions comme une paire de chaussures. Quand une pièce se perd, la pièce restante perd sa valeur. Tu me manques comme la musique, les manger, les boire qui manquent à une fête. Tu me manques comme un cerveau qui manque à une tête. Can you say after me, sache que tu me manques? Once again, sache que tu me manques. Okay, cool. It's good that we can interact. The, the second verse goes like this. Je pleure comme un petit qui perd un jouet qui te chérit bien. Avec une voix pleine de larmes, je crie, chérie, viens. Tu me manques comme le vaccin à un gosse. Sans ta douceur, je suis exposé à une mort précoce. Tu me manques comme l'arme à un soldat en guerre ou comme la mamelle qui manque à un bébé en l'absence de sa mère. Tu es indispensable à ma vue, comme l'eau à la vie. Tu me manques. <laughs> okay. I will, I will start again. Um, 
Yeah. So, je pleure comme un psy qui perd un jouet qu'il chérit bien. Avec une voix pleine de larmes, je crie, chérie, viens. Tu me manques comme le vaccin à un gosse. Sans ta douceur, je suis exposé à une mort précoce. Tu me manques comme la mamelle qui manque à un bébé en l'absence de sa mère. Tu es indispensable à ma vue, comme l'eau à la vie. Tu me manques comme l'écho à la cloche. Ton absence m'a vili comme un trou à la poche. Vie sans toi, je suis dans l'agonie. Ma vie sans toi est vie sans harmonie. Tu me manques comme les béquilles à un boiteux. Tu me manques comme la lampe qui manque en pleine obscurité. Sache que tu me manques. And the last one, uh, I love this verse a lot because it has a lot of... Uh, this is um, a style that we call in French calembour. So um, that, that's the reason why I love this one. Um, and uh, it goes like this. L'amour est le pont qui relie les deux rives de nos cœurs. Nourri par les mots qui dérivent de nos cœurs. Mes décisions s'écroulent par un seul coup de tes yeux. Les trompettes de ta voix écroulent les murailles de mon cœur. Comme un myope qui persévère. Je tergiverse, mais je persévère. Pour remettre ma pendule à l'heure, je suis contraint à persévérer. Vents et marées pour t'avoir à nouveau sur le train de mon piètre univers. Sache que tu me manques. Thank you very much. And uh, this last poem, before I, before I read or recite, I don't know, um, is, um, I will tell a story behind this one. Um, once I had a fight with a police officer in Malawi. Um, the reason why we had a fight is because um, he was so disrespectful to me. Uh, because I'm a refugee, and uh, anyways, I was uh, powerless because he's a police officer, he holds the power, and all I could do is just to be unhappy in my heart. And uh, when I went home, I thought that I could do something about it. So this one is a story about so many people I've met. Um, in 2008, I moved to Malawi, Um, and I've been living there as a refugee since then. And I was moved to a refugee camp called Zaleka Refugee Camp in Malawi. And uh, in the camp, I met so many amazing people. But all those amazing people, they had crazy stories that led them to become refugees. Uh, and I took different stories that I've heard from people. So everything that I would say in this poem, Um, is something I heard from someone. So it's um, a story of many. And um, unfortunately, it's still happening in so many places in the world, and people are still fleeing because uh, of uh, human wickedness, actually. And it's so unfortunate, and I hope that it stops one day, uh, that we can just live in peace um, with each another. But uh, yeah. For now, uh, all I can do is telling stories, and uh, this is a story of the people I met. It's uh, entitled, Imagine. Just imagine yourself in such a situation. Imagine yourself between the armor and the anvil, swimming in mud and dust, to the doors of the abyss. Imagine one day a bomb falls on your palace and creates a bloodbath all around. Imagine that one day your playground turns into a cemetery where the local bar becomes a site of desolation and tears. Imagine the soft music that's caressed your soul disappears and instead you hear the noise of boots and the crackle of Kalashnikovs. Will you accept to stay and die or choose to flee to stay alive? Imagine one morning armed executioners arrive at your door, hitting you soundly without sparing your father, your mother, and your whole family. Imagine that under threat of death, you are forced to have sex with your own mother 
that with your eyes you see an ugly duckling deflower, your sister of nine years old caressing her with a bayonet. Imagine one day that you see people without a heart assaulting a woman who is nine months pregnant. Will you accept to stay there, to see the same people go unpunished and inherit the throne, or will you go somewhere else, be rid of the trauma to come back with a new spirit? Imagine one day you're a victim of tribal conflict and one morning your whole family is burned alive. Imagine that due to religious belief or because of political affiliations, people are guillotined and beheaded. Will you accept to wait your turn or run to save your life? Imagine one day, because of your opinions, because of a poem or a song denouncing inequality and misdeeds of a corrupt regime, and in the end, the government pursues you for your disruptions, running the risk of disappearing into the world without leaving a trace or being imprisoned and then being released with poison in your body. Will you stubbornly accept this and wait for death or will you flee until the regime changes to return home to a country with your pride? Imagine a sudden situation arises and steals all your weight to make you a little bigger. If it happens to others, it can happen to you too. Those who mourn today laughed like you yesterday. Those who beg today were rich like you yesterday. Those who die of hunger today threw food in the trash like you yesterday. Those who sleep outside today had a comfortable home like you yesterday. But from the summit where they were, the lightning of the human wickedness reached them and buried them in the margins of society. Just imagine yourself in such a situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was amazing. And just maybe another round of applause for this amazing film. Um, sorry, I kind of ruined the second one. I got a little over exuberant about the, the Tumen Monk. <laughs> um, so now we're going to have a conversation between Trezor and Julie Chemin, who is here. Um, she is the executive director of the Halifax Refugee Clinic and has been so for 14 years, so very long time. Um, so Julie received legal training in France and the UK and personally worked um, in uh, asylum law, sorry, overseas, and including in Paris with Amnesty International. And Julie has been an advocate for migrant and refugee rights for the past 20 years. And she works for the Halifax Refugee Clinic, which is a wonderful grassroots nonprofit providing pro bono legal and settlement services and supports for refugees and refugee claimants across the Atlantic region. So thank you so much for being here. And I will hand it over to the two of you to have a discussion that I'm sure will fascinate everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, Trésor, especially for being here. Those were really powerful, beautiful pieces, um, and uh, we're honored that you were able to come to Halifax, to, uh, to Pier 21, to the museum, um, and I'm very excited to have this uh, discussion with you. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your musical journey. You were a musician in the Congo, from what I understand, and then obviously your your incredible work on the on the on the Tumaini Festival in Malawi. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and and how your refugee experience impacted your music and your art? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much Lee, for the question. Um, this is uh, yeah, it's been a journey. Um, I started doing music, I was still very young, and um, I've been having this passion for, for music, and um, I don't know if, uh, maybe, I think it's universal. A lot of parents, they, want, they don't want their children to do music uh, professionally. 
uh, and uh, they want them to do proper jobs um, in court. And um, I had that also with my parents. They never want me to do music, but um, um, I'm very blessed for being very stubborn. Uh, so I kept on doing what I love. Um, and uh, yeah, so then eventually everyone understood in my family that it was they should let me do what I love because I was unstoppable. And um, when doing the music, I started very young with uh, my friends, first in a children's band, um, and then I moved on to start doing, uh, at some point it was cool to be a rapper than being a singer, so I became a rapper um, uh, at the age of um, 15, and then I did music with my friends. Um, I always, I composed for my bands and things. And um, in 2007, I decided to leave my friends to focus on my career um, in solo because I thought that I had more to give through my music. Um, it was not just about doing the music, but it was a, for me it was a mission. Coming from a country, uh, from the DRC, which is a very, uh, it's a country with a very complicated history. Um, anyway, before independence, uh, the, the DRC is uh, the African country that was the most exploited, and uh, the, the, the Congolese people were mistreated by the Belgium uh, colonizer. And uh, for that, you can, there is a book even about it, King Leopold. Uh, the ghost, uh, talking about the atrocities that the Belgium did in the DRC. And um, uh, after independence, actually we never experienced independence uh, because from there there was uh, a coup d'etat and then uh, dictatorship. I was born under the dictatorship of Mobutu who stayed in power for 32 years. And uh, after him, there was another dictator who, who came in for three years and he was killed when uh, in his office, actually. And then uh, his son was imposed to us. So we grew up seeing that, the dictatorship and the atrocities and injustice. And uh, for me, I heard my parents always complaining about this, the, the regime of Mobutu, then complaining about the regime of Kabila, the father, and then the regime of Kabila, the son. And through my music, I thought that I could do something, not just complaining, but using my music as a vehicle to open eyes of uh, my, my fellow young people and also to start a movement uh, for change. And um, that was not good for the government because they didn't want us to speak freely and I got in trouble um, uh, actually, and uh, for that, my family had to help me evacuate uh, the DRC uh, quickly to go to uh, the next country, uh, or the neighboring country, which is Zambia. So I'm from Lubumbashi, which is just 110 kilometers from, uh, uh, from the Zambian border. So uh, yeah, that's how I got first to Zambia, and then after some months in Zambia, I ended up being in Malawi. And then in Malawi, you were in Zaleka. Yes, and in Malawi, I was, uh, uh, yes, I was uh, brought to the Zaleka refugee camp. Um, and um, yes, just living in the camp, arriving in the camp, it was quite a very different experience for me. Um, I'm coming from a middle class family in the DRC. I had a lot of opportunities. I went to the best schools uh, for my primary and my secondary school. Um, then I was at university, so I didn't even have a chance to graduate because I had to, to, to leave uh, in my last year to go uh, to, yeah, to, to, to flee because I had to save my life anyways. And um, yeah, getting in Zaleka, the situation was just very complicated. So first of all, just knowing that you are going to be sent to, to the refugee camp, that I was about to have a heart attack because what um, I know of refugee camps is uh, this very negative uh, image that is painted on TVs and in magazines and, uh, and we just saw that there was nothing uh, really, yeah, it was next to death being a refugee. And um, yes, I was taken to the Zaleka refugee camp, and 
Of course, it was not the end. People were there, people were living their lives, but just for me, the, 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 the contrast was so strong, you know, uh, from coming from a big city and um, having some privileges to a place where there was no any promises of a future. It was quite tough and so depressing. So I went under, I was under uh, uh, depression for, for a very long time. And uh, from there, I stopped doing music, I stopped writing. Actually, I even hated uh, music because I realized that it's because of it that I was in that situation. So my first years in the refugee camp, I never did any, any music or any writing. Actually, I didn't even have any inspiration. Uh, to be honest, and um, yeah, it was so tough, and uh, yeah, after that. And, and so what prompted you to start to make music again and to, and to you know, what prompted you to start the beginnings of, of this festival? Yeah, so being in the refugee camp, I saw so many difficulties, so many injustice. Uh, first of all, I should say that in Malawi, refugees do not have the freedom of movement, so they have to be in this refugee camp. And the refugee camp was created in 1994, after the genocide in Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, which also started the, the war in the DRC, which is still ongoing up to, to, to now. Um, and uh, during that time, the refugee camp was opened and people came and uh, the Zaleka was established as a refugee camp. But since then, some people were born there. Some people, people that were born there, some of them even have their own children now in the camp, but they do not have the freedom of movement. They have to stay in the camp um, all their lives. Uh, and also, no matter how long you stay in Malawi as a refugee, you cannot have a Malawian nationality, so you have to stay in the camp. And people do not have the, 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 the right to work, the right to start to do any business outside the camp. And also, uh, people have, young people, they do not have the right to education. So I, I saw just the all generation of people with no future. Imagine what can you do without education in life? What can you do without working for yourself? And depending actually on um, humanitarian aid, which is uh, actually like two dollars, uh, two and a half dollar um, per month, per person. So it's so little people need to work for themselves. Uh, to make a living, um, people need better health care and all of that. So the camp didn't have that because of the restrictions that malaria has imposed on refugees, and that's so unjust and um, and so uh, unhuman. Uh, and I saw that, and uh, the, the 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 fight in me was was shaking every day because, but there is nothing I could do, you know. But at the end of the day, I realized that I still had something, something that I know best is uh, I write, um, I speak, I'm a powerful speaker, and I'm a, I'm a musician, I have a talent, and I have these ideas, what could I do? Uh, the only way to fight is, was to fight and use the strength I have, and the strength I have is the power of uh, the arts. And um, I started using that, I started now thinking of what to do, and um, eventually, when you start, you also have people that come and listen to you, and people that are against that system that want to join the fight. So I mobilized a group of people that were not refugees, and uh, those people became my, my support system. They started introducing me to people, uh, to places. Uh, then I could get the permission from uh, the camp management to go outside the camp for a day or two for something, and then I could do my performances. And uh, in um, just a year, I was very lucky, Malawi being an English-speaking country, um, I was very lucky to be the only French-speaking um, artist in the country. So it made me, like once I started performing, it made me be noticed very quickly. 
uh, because also I had, it was not easy, so you become more vulnerable because you speak a language that other people don't speak. Um, and also as a refugee, you have always to tell your story because I had to tell my story was a story of many, and I made myself a voice for the voiceless. And uh, it was for me to put myself in that vulnerable position uh, because I knew that it was for the good of so many people. And I started advocating for the camp and for refugees in Malawi and telling the stories of what the story, uh, what situation refugees are living in Malawi. And it attracted a lot of attention, um, like of, uh, of uh, big channels like uh, Al Jazeera. They came in the camp, they made a documentary about me. Uh, it attracted attention of uh, big mainstream media and also the local media in Malawi. And um, yeah, it attracted attention of the diplomatic community, uh, the, um, attention of uh, the different stakeholders in Malawi, and that's made it very powerful. At some point, I became kind of uh, difficult to stop because I had all this exposure around me. And uh, that's when, at the end, I was like, after a year, I was like, how can I use this? platform, this uh, exposure, because that was power already, mm -hmm. and I thought of how I could use it. And to use it was not just going around telling my own story, but I thought also of bringing people to the camp so that they could hear more stories, so that they could see themselves, the situation, um, first hand. And that's when the idea of uh, the Tumaini Festival came. So in 2014, we started the first Tumaini Festival. Um, it was like a dream. I told I told a story uh, to my people in the camp. They thought that I was crazy because it was not feasible. I saw looking at the limitations refugees have, and um, people didn't believe that it could happen. But um, it eventually happened, and uh, it was a success already from the first year. And uh, yeah, today it's uh, the biggest festival in Malawi. Uh, bringing so many people from around the world in a refugee camp, uh, people staying inside the refugee camp with family, and also through the festival, what we do is uh, changing the narrative. People see refugee camps as places where people, places of despair, places of suffering, but we bring people in the camp and they don't, they see so much joy, so much life, and so much inspiration, you know, so, and also uh, people always think that they should give a shelter to refugees, but in this case, with the Tumaini Festival, through a program that we call the, the Zaleka Homestay Program, we make people come and be hosted by refugees in their houses, and refugees taking care of, uh, very good care of them. And for, with that, we have changed so much in how people see refugees and how people consider refugees, and also in the relationship between the refugees and the Malawians, and even the people, the tourists that are traveling to Malawi to come for the festival, they experience a different life of being hosted, being taken care of by refugees, and also they realize the humanity that is into refugees, and uh, yeah, so amazing friendship, uh, friendships have been created, so many opportunities have come from there on the financial, uh, social, psychosocial level. So it's really magical. Yeah, that's that's just incredible to to um, to be hosted in that way and to to change the narrative and and the rhetoric. Often between um, there's often a disconnect or or sometimes even an outright tension and conflict between the, the host country um, and, and the refugee camp um, because of, like you said, the, in, the, the ghettoization, the encampment policy where, where you don't have freedom of movement in the camp in, in Zaleka um, or freedom of education outward. So um, it's, really, it's really important. How, how do you feel that um, your work at Zaleka and the Tumaini Festival has impacted Malawian culture and society and, and maybe even policies towards refugees. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, before we started to doing the Tumaini Festival, for a non-refugee, it was illegal to go to the refugee camp. So. Once someone who is not a refugee, if they are media or anything wanting to go to the refugee camp, 
they will give them all these bureaucratic processes that are impossible actually, and at the end they will give up. So it was just for people to not go in there. Um, and um, the Tumaini Festival has shifted that uh, in a way that um, at the end the government has just been like, let it be. You know, because sometimes when the festival started growing, there was no way to stop it. I remember the first year in 2014 when we asked for permission to do the, to hold the festival. First of all, it was a no. That's something like that shouldn't happen in a refugee camp. And what we did, we, we didn't send the letter of, uh, of appeal to be like, uh, no, we need this to, to happen. What I did, I wrote a press release that I sent to all the media houses. And then, I wrote an official invitation to all the ambassadors in Malawi, like every embassy, they received my, my letter. All the international organizations, they received the letter. And at the end, we attacked it from mm -hmm. that way. And um, at the end, they were like, okay, okay, everyone is talking about this, we can't stop this, but uh, you can do it only up to, uh, to, to, to because the policies for even the workers, the UN workers that were going in the camp, they should leave the camp by 3.30. So it was like, that's the policy. But we can allow the festival to go up to 5.30. It was like, okay, good. And we did it the first year at 5, up to 5.30. We went maybe a little bit by 6, and then we stopped. The second year, we went by 8. The third year, we went up to the next day. And then they say, oh, no, people cannot stay in refugee houses. And then it was advertised. And the festival is so big and known. And people, everyone is booking. At the end, it would be like, OK, uh, we never had uh, funding from the UNHCR. They gave us that year funding for security. And we took that money. We organized security. And at the end, so many people lived in the camp with families. There was no incident. The next year, it happened again, and then they, they didn't talk about it anymore. So I thought that th there are so many ways to fight and to change policies, and uh, sometimes they are very soft ways, but they are very effective. And we have now the festival, which is et established as a win. Uh, the Tumaini Festival is on the Malawian government's website as one of the major events of the country. So that's, that's a big accomplishment. Yes, uh, that's a win already yeah. when we're recognized by the government. And when we have the festival now, every year the Minister of Culture comes to do the official opening of the festival. So it's something that everyone knows in the country and everyone knows, uh, talks about. And everyone has seen the benefit of it on the touristic level, bringing tourists uh, in Malawi uh, through that festival, encouraging also domestic tourism. in in Malawi, and just for an example, the area where the refugee camp is, there is nothing interesting that people could go and visit. So the festival has even taught Malawians or helped Malawians to visit a part of their country that was never spoken about, right? So that's something very beneficial for the country as well. Um, apart uh, from that, uh, the second thing I'll say, when we did the two, we started, before I started the festival, even what encouraged me to do the festival, I performed somewhere in, in Lilongwe, which is only 45 kilometers out of the camp. And people, Malawians that were born there, they never knew that there was a refugee camp next to them in their own country because it was kind of kept secret. And um, I started talking about the camp and talking about it and talking about, uh, and when we started the festival, now everyone in Malawi, every single person knows that there is a refugee camp that exists in Malawi. And most of the people have been there through the, the, the Tumaini Festival. Um, and when the festival has been happening, so many has changed, you know. So in the way people consider refugees, the way people treat refugees, and even Malawians, because Tumaini has created this movement of uh, Malawians becoming advocates for refugees because of the benefit that they have seen, because of the friendships that they have created, even because of what the refugees have introduced in the Malawian culture. 
Um, yes, I'll give this example again because it was requested. Um, I will talk about, um, I'll give a, just a, I will talk about one small thing, which is uh, when we do the Tumaini Festival, people go to Zaleka for the music, of course, for the interaction, because it's something cool. Just to go in a refugee camp, not talking about any refugee issue, not seeing any poverty, but just celebrating life in a mm. refugee camp, which is something special and different that has never happened anywhere in the world. And when people come, they also discovered that in the camp there were different things. Apart from the, those different things, there were also different food, for example. Uh, most of people in the camp, they are coming from uh, um, the East African region or the, the Great Region, uh, the Great Lake region, which is uh, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi. And when they came, they came with their cultures of food. And among the foods, there is um, a food called chapati, the Eastern African chapati. And, um, when people came, they discovered that food in the camp through the festival. And then some people come for music, and some people were looking forward. Every time there is a festival, they were looking forward to the chapati. And uh, they would come and have the chapati. And finally, restaurants in Malawi have discovered that there is a demand for chapati. And the chapati has been added on the menu in almost every cool restaurant in Malawi. And um, recently, um, a minister was uh, against refugees in Malawi, and he, uh, he, he made very um, serious um, press statements being against refugees. And uh, there was a movement on social media of young Malawians being pro-refugees and being against uh, the decisions and the statements of the minister. And uh, among those, uh, those comments, uh, I saw a few being like, so if you remove refugees in this country, how are we going to be eating the chapati again? You know, so, Hashtag chapati. Yeah, so, so, so that's just something that made me feel so happy and realize that just something as small as food can unify people. And um, there is a, a, an African proverb, um, I think it's a Luba proverb, uh, it says that we are not yet friends or we are not yet brothers if we haven't shared the same food, if we haven't shared a meal. And uh, so it's also just a way to see how foods can unify people and how it can make people really uh, understand and love each other because uh, all of us want to eat. Our body needs food and uh, food is something that makes all of us happy. And I'll just bringing a different food to other people can just make you be appreciated even more. So it's one of, uh, so many things have changed, so many impacts on even in the policy level, or more especially on the, on the social level. That's because we know that the UN is doing the, their work, lobbying for the policy changes. And us, we are dealing with the people, we are dealing with the heart and the souls of the people. We are dealing the with stomachs. the minds of, of the normal people. And uh, seeing those people being on our side, it's already a win. Yeah. I mean, it, food and, and, and art, you know, it's a, a powerful vehicle for, um, for cultural exchange. Yeah. Um, but it, then it has a big political impact as well, yeah. like you say. So it's, it's, it's so interesting. And, and this, um, this amazing story of the chapatis, um, you know, it's something so small, but it's also really a symbol of, of the of the great impact of, uh, you know, of your work and everybody's work at the uh, in Zaleka and, and with the festival. Yeah, um, just talking about at um, the other time, I was saying that uh, we have so many different languages in the world. The, mm -hmm. There are so many of them we can't even count, but um, there is. Uh, one language that all the people understand. And uh, that's the language of arts. Um, that's why we can be people of different backgrounds. We can be looking in one painting, and that one painting can tell us so many different stories. And every person in that painting, they will see 
they will relate to a certain story that they will keep on it themselves. And the same with music. I've been, all my life I was listening to Bob Marley. Um, when I was a kid, we were not understanding English. And uh, Michael Jackson, I understood everything because the, just the rhythm was touching my soul. I could dance without understanding the language. And I could, that could make me happy and change my mood. So that's why at Tumaini, we decided to use the arts to bring uh, for social change. Uh, that's my mission in life, to use the arts uh, to vehicle that message of, uh, of uh, peaceful coexistence, a message of uh, uh, mutual understanding and intercultural harmony. There is nothing powerful in bringing people together than the arts. And now, through to the Tumaini Festival, I even discovered that there is, uh, food is also very powerful in bringing people together. <laughs> Yeah, and like you were saying earlier, yeah. really bringing a voice to the voiceless, like yeah. in your last poem that we saw, Imagine. Uh, speaking of languages, um, I, I was reading the meaning of the word zaleka, yeah. which I believe means in, um, in Chichewa, in Chichewa yeah. it means I'm never going to try again? Yes, yes. So, Zaleka uh, means um, I'll never try again. I'll yeah. never do it again. So, it's uh, actually a story of someone who, who really promises to himself that he will never do, do something again. So, I will give the context. So, it's like when you do something and you are punished, and then you say, like, I'll never do it again. Mm -hmm. And so that place, first of all, it's like a place where the name already is a negative name, mm -hmm. uh, showing because before Zaleka, prior to becoming a refugee camp, Zaleka used to be a, a, minim, a maximum prison. That was, uh, uh, it was a prison for the most dangerous criminals only, and the people that did very bad things to the government. Uh, when Malawi used to be a dictatorship under, um, yeah, Nkamuzubanda. Uh, and, uh, and in that prison was so bad, the conditions of prisoners were was so bad, and it was a very dangerous place, and the prisoners just they, uh, died every day. And uh, according to stories of uh, people from the villages around that area, they say that there was a, um, like a, a pool with crocodiles and people were thrown there. And uh, that area was very cold and uh, they could just put someone outside uh, to history. spend the night and in the morning they are, go they are dead. And uh, they were forced to do some work um, actually. And, uh, so it was not in good condition, uh, people were not in good conditions and they were suffering a lot and that's where that name came. So then there's this history and this yeah. very heavy name and place and, and you chose to call uh, your festival, Tumaini Letu, I think yeah. in Swahili means our hope. Yes, <laughs> yes, right? yes. That's incredible. Yeah, we so have some for... footage of the festival, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you first, um, what is your hope? for the festival, for Zaleka, for refugees in Malawi and across the world? Um, yes, before going to across the world, I'll start with Malawi, <laughs> where I live, the country I call my second home. Um, I've been there for the past 14 years. Um, uh, I have so much hope. Um, I hope that one day the government of Malawi will understand that um, they have been wasting a lot mm -hmm. in just letting all the talents of refugees dying in them. Um, I'm just one of the refugees who has uh, contributed in putting Malawi on the map, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, and that is just in one domain. And we, I know refugees that I met someone who was a, a pilot before, and now he runs a small tax shop inside the refugee camp, right? I know um, engineers, uh, medical doctors that live in the camp. So many 
people because when refugees travel, they just don't travel with their luggage. They also travel with their brains, with their talents, and, uh, and their knowledge. And once given an opportunity, they can contribute so much. Malawi is among, it's uh, maybe the most, one of the most, uh, the poorest countries in the world. And uh, just having people that are there with talent, with uh, ideas that could contribute to developing the country, I think, I just believe that's one day the government will understand and will just open doors for refugees and the few refugees that are in Malawi, if the government could just let them be, let them go around the country and uh, let everyone exploit um, and, uh, and utilize their talents and their knowledge and their, um, their wisdom to contribute to the betterment of Malawi. Um, I, hope, I hope that the young refugees would be given an opportunity to go to universities, to do studies, and uh, yeah, to, to better their lives. What uh, young people without a, an education, it's as if you were poisoning their future. But sometimes I, I fear for those young people. What are they going to do once, if they're not refugees anymore, how are they going to cope in the society? And um, I just have that hope that Zaleka maybe as a refugee camp will be uh, transformed into something else and that the, the people could just uh, leave. And um, well, it looks like it's happening with the, yes, the festival yes, to it's, it's give happening. opportunity to it's, showcase talent. Yeah. And what we do before the government does that, as what we do, we open the doors of the refugee camp, we build bridges between refugees and the world so that people can come. And when they come, through our work, we create opportunities for employment, we create opportunities for talents to shine and to find opportunities outside. We make connections and uh, that's all we can do. And um, with Tumaini Festival, my biggest dream is uh, to, to replicate that model in so many other countries. So I'm thinking of four other countries in Africa where we, we can use the power of the arts to, to promote social cohesion mm -hmm. and uh, mutual understanding and peaceful coexistence. And we can use the arts, like in South Africa, to fight xenophobia. Um, and so... It's a powerful vehicle. Yes, sure. that's my, my, my hope, and that should happen in the five coming years. Yeah, well, with your stubbornness, I'm sure it will. Yes. <laughs> I think we have a video of the festival that we're going to put on now, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. I think when, when you mention camp, a uh, refugee camp, uh, people really expect that it's a place where people are just being kept and no, no, there's no real life and it's, it's just people away from home. To mine means hope. Being a refugee means maybe uh, many refugees are losing hope. They free their country because of many reasons. Then, with the Tumani Festival, we refresh a little bit. Refugees enjoy a little bit, and the day try to forget what happened in their bad countries. It is bring people together from all walks of life, particularly let's say from the African circle. People are here and they are enjoying themselves. Bumai. Yeah, they played some cool jazz. They performed songs in Chitumbuka. Though I didn't hear the lyrics themselves, but I could feel the feeling of so the communication through the, the music itself. So, so it's vibrant. The refugees are just people like all everyone. We, I think I didn't have much of an awareness about what happens in Zaleka and about Zaleka itself. So being here and seeing like the cross culture and sharing of different bands, different music, it's, it's very impressive. They think that the camp is somewhere that cruel people are, but actually there are people like anyone. And they're kind people, I must say.
festival, what I'm saying, it's perfect, it's awesome. Come and watch, because you never regret it. <laughs> I'm speaking from experience. Just come, yeah. Come to the festival, it's interesting. Incredible. I think we'll all be going to the 2022 one now. We'll find the lineup online. Were there any questions? Yeah, so the question you heard, how many people uh, live in the refugee camp? Thank you very much. Um, now there are almost 55,000 people uh, living in the camp. Yeah. So, like, this video was made in 2016. Um, as you could say, uh, in 2016, there were 25,000 people. And now in 2022, we have uh, 50, almost 55. So it's almost the, yes, almost the double, uh, the, uh, the number that it was uh, back then. And if I should explain, that is due to one reason, there are conflicts still going on in, um, in the eastern part of the DRC and uh, also in Burundi mm -hmm. and uh, some other people for some reasons are still um, fleeing from Rwanda. So th that's why the numbers are still, are still growing. Uh, there is no running order. Uh, there are boroughs where people have to pump to get water. Um, and uh, so I will just talk a little bit about this. So when the camp, it used to be a prison uh, to just have a few people. And um, when the prison was closed due to uh, some uh, pressure from uh, the international community because it was unhuman to have that prison treating people in that way. Uh, the Malawian government had to close it. And when refugees came to Malawi, uh, or refugees from the Great Lake region came to Malawi, uh, the government gave that space to be used as a refugee camp. So actually it's a place where they shouldn't be comfortable. Uh, maybe so they ran to go to another place, but unfortunately, or fortunately, people were very strong and very resilient. They kept on living there. They bettered the, the place because people transform places. So they transformed that place, and uh, now it's like a village, a big village. Uh, but the camp was um, meant to only have, uh, to have maximum 10,000 people. Um, and uh, because of the resources around, and, uh, but unfortunately, uh, people came and uh, they started, you know, um, multiplying or so because uh, babies are born in the camp, um, uh, children are growing and then they are becoming parents as well. And also because of the conflicts, more people are still coming uh, to the camp. And uh, yeah, so now the camp is very congested because it's meant to have only 10,000 people but now, with 55,000 people, they have to share those few resources. So, yeah, and um, slowly the, uh, the, the electricity is coming in the camp for people that can afford to pay for it. Water is for free because you go and pump, but anyone can have now electricity because you have poles of electricity going around. But uh, now it's now depending on who can afford but not everyone can afford, but because what refugees receive as food per month, um, it's uh, in value, it's uh, two dollars and a half per person uh, for a whole month. And uh, so imagine that people should use that money to, to feed themselves and to pay electricity and all of that. So it's only a few because that can afford, but not everyone. Are there any more questions from the, the live audience? Or from the live stream audience? A question over here. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much. The question is about chapati. So <clears throat> chapati is uh, sort of a bread. I don't know. It's uh, a bit uh, like the simple way I could explain it. It's like a bit like a pancake, but it's not a pancake. So it's a sort of a bread that is flat. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, actually, it's also a borrowed culture from India, if I'm not mistaken. So it came from India. Uh, it's, uh, it was spread in Uganda because you had a lot of people from India in Uganda. And then it went to Kenya and then Tanzania and then the DRC. So, um, and it's a different variety of chapati than the ones from India because it's, uh, people started adding their own style. Uh, that's why the chapati that we eat um, in Zaleka, it's, it's, it's called East, um, East African chapati. So, because it's a different variety of chapati. And we also Soon it'll be a Malawian yes. East African chapati too. Yes, and we do, it, we do it with eggs, which we call chapati mayai. In Uganda, they call it Rolex. So, it, <laughs> so it's getting also to, to becoming, uh, to finding different ways of cooking it and people are experimenting, yeah. It really showcases how, you know, this, this narrative that we have about refugee camps are that they are, um, you know, desolate places that are just temporary. Everyone thinks of literal tents. Um, but Zaleka, that's 30 years, right? That it's been, and, and you were saying people having babies. So, so, so refugee camps can be very permanent, really, in cities and in, in intergenerational um, and, and not this, you know, temporary encampment like, um, you know, like people see. And we really see how vibrant and, and, uh, and incredible it is from, from that footage. Yeah, uh, and that's the image we want to show of refugee camp. Yeah. Uh, because most of the time people see these temporary tents and people crying and uh, people being very, um, losing their weights and almost mm -hmm. uh, dying. And that's a very bad image that actually shows refugees always on this very weak position. And uh, with uh, what we do, or like it's to, huma uh, to, to humanize refugees because that's what they are, human beings with talent, with potential, with beauty. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, knowledge um, and and all every greatness a human being can have, and that the image we want to show of refugees, uh, the true image of humanity, and uh, most of the time when photos are put in magazine and in the news, it's notes of people smiling, but refugees smile, and for me, there is a place where I learned about strength, human strength and resilience, is at Zaleka. So being in that refugee camp, I actually discovered even some strength that I didn't know that I had before. Uh, now I'm 10 times stronger than I used to be before I became a refugee, because that strength was, I was given the opportunity of exploring it inside the camp, just by being challenged by these people, by people going through so much, yet still keeping a smile, yet still being positive every day. People that transform the place with no money, like uh, when the camp started, it, it was a permanent place, it, it started with people living in tents. Mm -hmm. But after years, people started making bricks themselves to build their, their mm -hmm. houses and put a big plastic sheet on top and put grass on top and they could live with that. And in the camp, I learned how to make bricks. I co-builded my house, my first house in the camp, with the help of the other people in the community. So actually, I didn't know that I could build a house one day. So um, I discovered that. And then everyone tried. And at the end, people also tried to beautify their houses because they, they thought that they were there for a year or two, but they are there for forever. Then they have to make their lives better where they are because that's their country. Mm -hmm. Now it's just for some children that were born in Zareka, now they are adults. That the, that the country they know. 
So how can they make it beautiful? And for me, that's what has inspired me more. It's the power of the people, the strength of the people. And uh, with that strength, I'm like, what if they just let them be in this country? If they open doors for them, how much can they contribute? How can they help in transforming Malawi if they transform this temporary refugee camp into a home and by building their own houses and uh, making it a better place for them, at least, um, within their means. So me, that strength is um, something magical. It inspires me every day when I look at that. And that's what I want to, the, the world to know, and that's what I want people to see. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are afraid for you. You're afraid of what you don't know. Uh, everyone is afraid of an unknown. And what I want, uh, my mission is to demystify uh, the refugee image so that people get to know the real refugees because they're afraid of us, because they don't know us. Me, anyways, I'm the only, maybe the only person who brags about themselves being amazing uh, because it's true, I am. And <laughs> I'm, I'm a refugee yes, and I still live in a refugee camp mm -hmm. um, in Malawi. And um, yeah. Uh, I've traveled everywhere in the world being an ambassador for my fellow refugees in Malawi, and I'm sure that I still have so many countries to visit and yeah. talk about this. You have a lot of work left to do, but it's just really yeah. incredible what you've done. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful to speak with you and to, and to hear your art tonight, Trésor. Um, I think that's probably it for our program, unless there are any other questions. And I want to thank the uh, Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. And yeah, thank you very finished. much. Um, Trezor, we look forward to your expansion of the Tumani Festival into mm -hmm. other countries. Um, and also, I think you've given everyone here a lot to think about when it comes to refugee camps and that the end goal doesn't need to be the closure of the camp it can be the integration of the people that live there into yes. the community. So I think that that's something that maybe many people, including myself, have never really thought about. So thank you. And thank you to Julie, and thank you to Meredith. And uh, for everyone uh, who came tonight, merci beaucoup, thank you so much. Um, and please uh, check our website for upcoming Canada Storytellers events. We have some in June and one more in um, in May. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone watching at home. Have a good night. See you all in Malawi in November. Thank you. Thank you.